Well, okay, he's in, he's, he's certainly in a Christian milieu, mm -hmm. okay? He's in a country of, of Christians and that sort of thing, as opposed to Jews or Muslims or, or something like that. Um, and he's writing for an audience that are Christians. And, but, so these, but Almighty God could easily be said by a Jew as much as by a Christian, right? Same, same God, actually, right? Um, so, do you see him saying anything about Jesus? No. That's what would yeah. indicate real Christian belief, right? Okay, so, um, but one interpretation of it is that he actually is an atheist and an irreligious person, and he's against the power of churches because he wants supreme political authority to exist in a political individual, not in a church. And that these expressions like Almighty God and so forth are a kind of audience control. This is how you talk to other to people who actually have those beliefs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he doesn't want people just to reject the book because some atheist wrote it and I don't read stuff atheists wrote. So he has what we call plausible deniability about his atheism. <laughs> okay? But yes, he's he's in a he's in a very Christian context with a Christian audience, a Christian country, Christian armies warring against each other of various kinds. Okay? Now what I want to do today is more carefully go through these last chapters of human nature where we get the account of the laws of nature. And I introduced those last time we met, way back last week, seems like years ago. Uh, but we had to progress through it rather rapidly, and how it is we get derive these laws of nature, and how these laws of nature result in a body politic or a civil society or a political society, basically. How we get from this state of nature, which I'm using this piece of art to characterize what it's like, the war of all against all, in which life is not only nasty, brutish, and short, but also, what else? Poor and solitary. Poor and solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. And we went through a lot of that, but I want to I review what he says about natural right and make sure everybody is keeping distinct in their minds the ideas of natural right on the one hand and natural law on the other, because they are not the same thing. So if you remember what he says about natural right in human nature, I'll just read it to you. It's not against reason that a man does all he can to preserve his own body and lives, both from death and pain. And that which is not against reason, men call right, or just, or blameless liberty of using our own natural power and ability. What, what are our natural powers and abilities? Yes, physical strength wit, passions, and reason are the four that he gives, okay? So we have those by nature. We're born with those. Those are congenital um, benefits that we have just by virtue of being the kind of things that we are by nature. And so we, by nature, we can use these powers however we want. Okay, so it's a right of nature that every man may preserve his own life and limbs with all the power he has. Every man by nature has a right to all things. And by comparison, this is how it's put in a, another political work of Hobbes, De Kive, and then in Leviathan. The first foundation of natural right, he says in On the Citizen, De Kive, 
is this, that every man as much as in him lies endeavor to protect his life and members, he must also be allowed a right to use all the means and do all the actions without which he cannot preserve himself. Nature is given to everyone a right to all. And in Leviathan he says, the right of nature, which writers commonly call use naturale, which means natural justice, really, uh, is the liberty each man has to use his own power as he will himself for the preservation of his own nature, that is to say, of his own life, and consequently of doing anything which in his own judgment and reason he shall conceive to be the aptest or you know, best means thereunto. Okay, so that's, that's what we all have a natural right to. Okay, before there's any such thing as natural law, okay, even in the state of nature, we have that natural right. Okay, now let's talk about Hobbes' views on laws of nature. Now, first of all, I've, I've told you that you know, in a way, the term law of nature or natural law is a very confusing term. It's a, it's a, it's a con, it seems like a contradictory term, okay? Because laws are something created by humans and nature is something not created by humans. So how can these two be brought together into a single uh, notion? It's like saying artificial nature or natural machine or something. It, 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 it doesn't... It, it, it should sound awkward. We hear it so often that it doesn't sound awkward anymore, but it is an awkward notion. And there are flawed concepts of laws of nature. For example, that what all nations consent to, or the wisest and the most civil nations, and of course, if you're English, you think that's England. Uh, and even if you're not English, sometimes you think that's England. If you're American, you definitely think it's not England, but you think it's America, that exceptional country, right? And if you're Chinese, you think it's Chinese is the, is the wisest and most ancient and most civilized country, right? And so the laws of those, and if you're from India, you think it's India, right? Um, he says that can't, natural law cannot, whatever it is, cannot be based on that because there's no agreement about who's wisest. I think the English are the most foolish people that have ever existed on the face of the planet. So I don't agree that what they say is natural law is natural law. Right? I think the Chinese have way better laws than they do. So if I can... We could never possibly reach agreement about that if we took as our standard what is considered to be the best nation or what supposedly all nations agree in. There is no agreement about that. So that can't be what natural law is. And sometimes it said it's what all humans consent to or what all humans agree to. Um, one problem with that is there is no such thing. There is nothing that all humans agree to. And it's also a problem because if all humans did miraculously agree on something, then that would just be part of our nature itself, and that would have something to do with natural right, and we couldn't violate it. So it couldn't really be a law. Okay, of course we can break laws. You can obey laws, you can break laws. Okay, and there's no reason why natural laws should be thought uh, any different. So, Hobbes distinguishes and says, these aren't what natural laws are, and his theory must be something other than this, than saying all countries end up agreeing with this, or even all people end up agreeing with that. So, his theory of natural law does not have to be something that all people or all countries agree on, or even that any country or any person agrees on, agrees with. He derives his notion of natural law from reason, one of the four 
powers as he summarizes it. Okay, so he points out that all humans carried away by passions or evil customs do things against laws of nature. Okay, so laws of nature are frequently broken. In fact, maybe they're always broken. Everyone breaks law of nature. You don't want to admit this too much, but you know, I broke the law of nature, you know, three or four times before breakfast. Um, and so, and, and the cause of that is different passions that we have. That's what gives rise to different people. So we treat other people badly, or we um, break laws and so forth because, for example, you want to drink. You have a desire to drink alcohol, but you're not 21, so you, the, it's the, the passion is what's driving you to break the law, the desire for that thing, right? Or you're married, but you commit adultery. Why? Because you have a passion for this other person. It's the desire and the pleasure that you're going after and ignoring the law that forbids uh, adultery. But of course, not only passion, but reason is equally part of human nature. And reason, according to Hobbes, is the same in all humans. And it's, a, it's an equalizer of all humans. So in Hobbes' view, Reason is a necessary and sufficient condition for being a human. And unlike, say, Aristotle, who thinks that some people naturally have better reasoning faculties than other people, Hobbes says that's wrong. All human beings are the same on this scale, and they're all equal, and they all equally can use reason. Now, if we were just rational beings, okay, like angels, okay, we didn't have bodies and we didn't have these, these passions that flow from them, then there would be no differences between humans. We'd all do the same things. We wouldn't need laws to govern what we would do, because our reasoning would bring us to the same conclusions always. Okay, yeah. Um, so what is Hobbes' definition of what is evil? Is that to be like, to succumb to passion, to Hobbes' that what he defines as evil, or to do something against the law? Okay, so we defined evil <coughs> earlier. How, 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 can somebody remind us, maybe we don't have the definition on the tip of our tongues, but how does he explain evil? It's, un, it's whatever is unpleasant to you. Okay, so he reduces evil to what's unpleasant. And, and what's painful. Let's call it pain. Okay, pain is what's evil, and pleasure is what's good. Okay, but it's pursuing pleasures and trying to avoid pains, thus pursuing and avoiding things in accordance with passions that cause us to behave differently. And, and uh, so those differences are always going to result in differences between countries, between individuals, and so forth. And so they can't really be the basis of a natural law. But reason can, because again, according to this claim, maybe he's wrong. Maybe Aristotle was right, and some people naturally have deficient forms of reason, so deficient that they are naturally slaves, and other people are naturally masters, and those natural masters should, by nature, govern those natural slaves. That's Aristotle's view. And take my course on Aristotle if you want to learn about that view, like Phoenix is <coughs> suffering through. Um, but you might just as well get rid of that argument and disagree with it, because I think it's wrong, and I think Hobbes is right that humans are all equal, and they all have equal reasoning capabilities. So he thinks that reason is going to be the basis for talking about these natural laws, and that all humans, using their reason, agree to be directed and governed in a certain way that conduces to that which they desire to obtain. 
their own good. Now, what that good is is different, but we all agree that we should be direct and, and governed in such a way that it's possible. So again, um, Phoenix might like vanilla ice cream and I might like chocolate ice cream, but assuming we both get pleasure from ice cream, we both want that goal and could rationally set things like earning enough money in order to buy it and actually finding a place that sells it and that sort of thing. And even though there are differences in our passions, our reason produces the same uh, result. And we, we also would both agree to be governed by a structure that makes it possible to have ice cream parlors that sell both chocolate and vanilla ice cream, and that we live in a society where we can earn adequate money in order to buy ice cream so that we can, and that, and that there aren't marauders that are going to, or pirates that are going to steal our money between here and getting to the ice cream shop and so forth. So even though we might disagree on exactly what it is we want, we agree that we want a structure that makes it possible for us to obtain those things we consider good and avoid those things that we consider bad. And again, on his extremely reductionist picture, that just amounts to what causes us pleasure and pain. Okay, so here is his technical, his best definition of defining law of nature in general. I couldn't find a definition of law of nature in general here in human nature. So if anybody else can find one, uh, let me know. Um, but I did find in parallel sections in Leviathan and on the citizen general definitions. A law of nature is a precept or general rule found out by reason by which a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive of his own life. And the law of nature that I might define it is the dictate of right reason conversant about those things which are either to be done or to be omitted for the constant preservation of life in members as much as lies in us. Okay, so it's a law of nature that we want to do that, which, that, that we want to protect our own life. Now, that stems from our natural rights. That's related, of course, to our natural right. That is to do whatever we need to maintain that. Okay, so natural law is not disconnected from natural right. I'll, I'll explain how they, how they can differ and how they can be at variance in due course. Yeah? Um, so, okay, so he has, he says, like, <laughs> general rules come about from reason, but like, isn't it indicative of like the fact that there are no really general, like there's a, I guess a few general rules, but for the most part people also disagree about the, the general, even the general rules, so isn't, doesn't that also like lead him to believe that there's no such thing as like... Okay, uniform? first of all, first of all, where are you getting the term general rule from, from, the, from the first one? Yeah. A law of nature is a precept or general rule. Found out by, by reason. reason. So like that. Okay. Found out by reason, which is not, which is according to him, uniform. Yeah. More or less, like that we all have in the same capacity. Yes. Like. Right. So we discover by reflection, or we learn it by teaching. Okay. Which is just experience at one step removed. That, um, that it's a. It's a general rule that you don't do that which is destructive to your own life. But like people disagree on those rules, right? Well, do, does anybody disagree? So does anybody think, no, I should do what's destructive for my own life? Mm -hmm. That's, that, that I think is important for me to be able to destroy my own life. Yeah, what if it's does, important does to anyone hold that? be able to destroy your own life? Like, if it's important <clears throat> for someone to just be able to have that option, like, I don't know. Possible. Well, yes. So I guess I guess Hobbes doesn't he, doesn't he doesn't think it's possible. He doesn't think it's psychologically possible because we all have passions towards our ends pleasure. that we want and pleasure and so forth. 
And so this gets back into the problem about whether masochism really exists that we talked about before. Can anybody, is, is there any pleasure which is at the same time a pain? And so is there any um, destruction of your life that is at the same time preservation of your way of life? And he doesn't think those are coherent concepts. So again, you might have different ideas about what to do with your life and what makes a good life. And of course, we all probably have very different notions of what that is. But Hobbes doesn't think that any of us have a notion that we shouldn't be protecting whatever the way of life we think is good, or that we should do something destructive of it. I mean, I think another case besides masochism, and a, a more important case, is suicide. Okay, isn't suicide destruction of life? And certainly there are people who think that suicide is permissible. I think suicide is permissible. No, I'm planning to kill myself at some point. Um, so uh, so there, there doesn't appear to be general agreement on that. Um, so, do we, we, so we need, maybe we need an interpretation of destructive of his life, and maybe life means not just mere um, survival-like functioning, but way of life, something so that, so that you, you're actually continuing living could be destructive to your way of life. Uh, like if you're, if you're forced to do unjust things or something in order to continue your life, then it might be justified to destroy your literal life in order to preserve your way of life. That would be one way of thinking about it. What we should do is actually look at what Hobbes says about civil laws against suicide. And if he happens to say anything about permitting masochism. Uh, but that would be a matter of civil of the civil law. Um, but I, you know, I think that, that possibly constitutes a counterexample. So I think, I think that Hobbes probably thinks that, that suicide is, violates natural law. Now, of course, that's, it's possible for people to violate natural law, but maybe the reason we think suicide is a regrettable thing and we're all against it and negative when we hear about it and sad and consoling people, not congratulating them when we hear, oh, your son committed suicide, great, he got out of this miserable, horrible world we live in. That's, that's just wonderful he was able to accomplish that. No, we don't think that. We think something went wrong. It was, in, in fact, it was, could have even been a bad or immoral thing that that person did. Right? So Hobbes seems to be on that side, that there is no... Um, that it's against nature to destroy your own life. Just like it would be against nature to pursue your own pain and to avoid your own pleasures. Okay, it definitely happens, but, but he might have to say that's against natural law. But I'm, 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 I'm with you. I think there are, the, we'll see if this is general enough. Yeah? Um, beyond like masochism and suicide, what would be his position on human sacrifice? Like for the sake of the Leviathan at large, like a soldier sacrificing himself for the sake of the community to preserve the state of the community and sacrificing himself for that. As well, to an end. yeah, it seems that the analysis I have to give of that is like the one I gave about enriching this idea of preserving your life, meaning way of life, not just not just biological subsistence. So, if if um, if my country is being invaded and everybody is going to be enslaved and lose liberty, then I might be willing to give up my, my actual life in defense of this way of life that I, that I want to uh, preserve. And then that would be consistent with the law of nature. But look, if, if, you, if, you, if we allow that, Okay, we start allowing that and start talking about as if life is an equivocal notion here that doesn't just mean biological life but could mean these other things, then we're actually going to really complicate and expand the matter of what is a law of nature. So that's, that's kind of a dangerous move and we have to figure out if it makes more sense for him to do that, to allow that expansion and that, and that equivocation and vagueness on the 
concept of life or whether he should just stick with the hardline biological concept of life and bite the bullet and say, I don't care what you say, suicide, masochism, self-sacrifice are against laws of nature. Okay, but it, I, I, I think that we get the answer to these questions in civil laws that attempt to give us the specific precepts that are based in laws of nature. So we may be able to revisit that issue. But as it, as it stands, now, this definition doesn't exist in human nature, so, it's, so he's maybe not committed to this concept of, of a law of nature in that, in that work. That's another possibility. So let's, let's look at formulations of what he says is the fundamental law of nature, and we can continue to interrogate them along these lines that these questions have, have profitably raised. Okay, so here's the one that we get in 15, section 1. <coughs> there can therefore be no other law of nature than reason, nor no other precepts of natural law than those which declare us unto the ways of peace, where the same may be obtained, and of defense when it may not. Okay, so the fundamental law of nature is pursue peace. You, you may not have realized from looking at this picture of him, but you know, Hobbes is a pro-peace sort of hippie, right? That's why he has long hair and is wearing this, this strange collared thing, okay? Because he's a peacenik. He thinks everything we do has to be for the point the, the, the most fundamental basis of all laws and of all society is that we should pursue peace. Again, the first and fundamental law of nature is that peace is to be sought after where it may be found, and we're not there to provide ourselves for helps of war. Okay, That's our natural right. So where we can't find peace, we are in a state of nature, and the only thing governing any of us is our natural right, and our natural right is to do whatever we need to do to preserve our life and limb. And this is, the, this is what he says in, in Leviathan. It is a precept or general rule of reason that every man ought to endeavor peace. Okay, and endeavor was a technical notion that he, that he defined in relation to passions and so forth, we ought to pursue peace as far as he has hope of obtaining it. And when he cannot obtain it, that he may seek and use all helps and advantages of war. The first branch of which rule contains the first and fundamental law of nature, which is to seek peace and follow it. The second, the sum of the right of nature, which is by all means we can to defend ourselves. Now, by the way, in human nature, De Kive are on the citizen and Leviathan, there are three different enumerations of the laws of nature, and there are actually a different total number of laws. And it, they seem to grow as, as he goes on. He thinks, oh, I, 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 I forgot an eighth law of nature that I should have added in there. And so there's 20 or something in Leviathan where there's only... 14 or whatever listed and numbered uh, here. But that's not, that's not all that important, although somebody could easily look at why did he add this other one in the Leviathan, or why did he add this other one in De Kive that he then drops in Leviathan, but he added it versus human nature. Um, so he's working out exactly how the theory goes, but there seems to be agreement on what the fundamental law is. Okay, that, that we need to pursue peace. Yes? Um, I'm trying to apply this logic of, like, you can use war in order to pursue peace. But, like, there's, I, I feel like this can run into some problems. Well, okay, first of all, you can't use war to, it's, it, 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 it's not that simple of you can use war to pursue peace. It's where you cannot obtain peace, there you are permitted to engage in war. Right, but still, it seems like this can run into lots of problems when people have a wrong idea of what peace means. Well, that's true. Um, 
and, and we'll get to that, but I just want to make sure we're not um, creating a false problem here that he's saying we, that, right, that war is instrumentally justifiable right. for the sake of peace. Right, where you cannot achieve peace, you can use the yes. tools then, of war then, to achieve yes. peace. Yes. Exactly. Okay. But so that, that, that that's actually a much different claim than that right. you can use war in order to achieve peace. Okay. So fine. I shortened it. But yes. Um, yeah. Even with where you cannot achieve peace, you can. Right. Use war so to so peace. this this seems this seems um, void for vagueness. So so vague that I, I mean after all we killed. Suleimani with a drone yeah. attack because we're pursuing peace. Yes. And he planted roadside bombs in Iraq because he was pursuing peace. Right. Okay? And so both of us in going to warfare there are pursuing peace, right? So there's something wrong with that. That can't possibly that's 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 internally contradictory. Um, so so it must be wrong to describe one or both of those acts as pursuing peace. And we need a more substantial indication of what it means to pursue peace. If, he, if the book ended there, in chapter 15, he said, so everybody pursue peace, and he really was just a hippie that, that was wearing a peace symbol or, or making a peace sign and saying, yes, we should all pursue peace, that would be lame and would go nowhere and would have exactly the problems you're talking about. Okay, so that's why he gets very specific and specifies, you know, 14 or 18 specific laws of nature that follow from this fundamental law that indicate exactly what he's <coughs> talking about by pursuing peace. So he has a very specific notion of what it means to pursue peace. And it's going to be very different from a lot of other people's notion of what it is to pursue peace. Okay, so pursuing peace means for him supporting essentially a monarchical authority. All right. Now, you know, I'm an anarchist. I don't think that any there should be any government. There shouldn't be any kings. There shouldn't be any any legislatures or anything. Uh, so I disagree with him. I think I think all those uh, organizing all those things end up causing war. And that if you want to get rid of war, you need to get rid of governments and government authority, okay? So then I have a very, so I, if so, if that's really Monty Johnson's view, then I have a fundamental disagreement with Hobbes' uh, non-fundamental laws of nature, although I would be agreeing with him about the fundamental law of nature, that I think we should all pursue peace, but I think you pursue peace by dismantling authority structures instead of building them up like he, he thinks. Okay, so he is, he is committed to a specification, an extremely specific set of arguments that derive from this fundamental law and not just the general statement about peace, which again would be lame and is lame when it's just made like that. Okay? Does Hobbes think that while you're endeavoring in peace, since you don't have peace, that you're then in a state of war? Yes. Okay, so it's one or the other. If you're seeking peace, then well, uh, this is this is an interesting question because we can ask at what point you're no longer you're no longer at war and so you are um, required to do the things consistent with peace, consistent with these other natural laws, which will which we'll get to. And what is, what is the actual moment where we can say that's happening? We'll, we'll, we'll raise that as a problem as we go through these other ones. He tries to avoid that by a sort of step-by-step -step process of exactly how you know when you're out of the law of nature, uh, where you're out of the state of nature. But the thing is, is, the state of nature never actually goes away. And we can be out of the state of nature in this classroom because we all agree to a common authority. Monty Johnson, the god of this classroom, the sovereign and god of this classroom. We all agree, I have authority, what I say goes and so forth, and so we have a nice peaceful uh, situation in here. But when we get out into that crazy world out there where people ride bicycles in a chaos of people, okay, you, you step right into, the, into a state of nature out there where people are breaking all these rules, and you have to do what it takes to defend yourself. 
Like the other day, a guy almost drove a bike into me, and so I had to push him out of the way. I don't normally push people on bikes, but it was either him or me. Okay, and and maybe in this country, you know, in theory, we have a civil society here. I think it's sort of collapsing very quickly, but we've got a civil society here. But what about our relationship to other civil societies? What about our relationship to um, Iran? Okay. So that, Hobbes says, is a state of nature. The relationship of one commonwealth to another is just a state of nature. You can do whatever, it, whatever you think you need to do to preserve yourself. Thus, we can assassinate their people. They can bomb our troops that are occupying some other country. And we, we're not required to pursue. We're not, we, we, we're not, we're not Biden, we're not beholden to any particular authority there because there is no common power or measure that we all have to agree to. Okay, so it's not like the state of nature just goes away and now we have world peace all of a sudden. The only way that could happen on Hobbes' theory, I think, world peace, would be world government. That's why I was saying the other day the extension of, of this theory seems to be to require that we have a world government. If we really want to get over, and, and I think you know it's even more important now because the threat of violence from nuclear war and destruction from climate change and everything is way more serious than just the problems you have walking out here and whether somebody's going to rob you or something. We're talking about species extinction now. So it might, it might be the case that if we're going to deal with that problem, we have to submit, we have to take away sovereignty from countries and subject them to some common authority. Whether they like it or not, we may have to sign up for something like that. Okay, you had a question, please. Yeah, I think, I think later on he does get to kind of, even though he's, right now he's not putting limitations or kind of, you know, restrictions on war, and, you know, he says, seek any means, any helps, any advantages. He does later on start to put, like, caveats and restrictions on things like revenge. Okay, in 19, section 2, I think it is, he says, what about laws of war? Okay, and I, I, I like this section, it's very dense. Um, and what he says there is, there's not much to say. Okay, because there's this Latin expression which strangely Gaskin doesn't translate, and I think it's inter, inter arma silent leges, if memory serves. And that means uh, in war, laws have no effect, or laws are not even listened to, not even heard. Okay, um, and he says, but there is an exception to that actually cruelty. Nobody thinks that cruelty in war is a good thing. No one thinks you should not just destroy your opponent, but you know, torture him very slowly and so forth. Um, and even pirates. And he tells this wonderful story about pirates that, yes, they go and raid and steal and steal everybody's crops or whatever from this coastal area that they invade but they leave them with the means to produce more. They don't destroy everything, absolutely. It's not like total war. Uh, it's, um, you just take what you need to survive. So even raping, okay, which means, you know, seizing by violence, even in that case, everybody, reason agrees that we should avoid <coughs> cruelty. But he says there's nothing, you can't, I mean, that's all you can, say about it, basically. Now, people want to say more, and my colleague Saba Bazargan wants to come up with a whole theory about how we could have just wars, and we could have all kinds of laws and constraints on what we're doing in war and so forth. To me, that's much more of a pipe dream than what Hobbes is talking about, okay? Because when we're in a state of war, violence and fraud and wronging other people are virtues and they're great things. That's what great heroes destroy and kill and maim the, the enemy and so forth. And that's exactly what we have to avoid when, if we're actually pursuing peace. And so it doesn't seem that we can combine these two into one, into one state, as it were, and have a nice, happy state where we're all at war with each other. But that's what it would be to have, you know, laws of war or something. Um, 
So that is a doubtful notion. Now, let's just rapidly proceed through some of the other laws to see how specific he gets and how he tries to get from this general and admittedly vague notion of peace to where he wants to go. So what, what, what he treats next is the second law of uh, nature and human nature is divestment of natural right. Okay. So a precept of the law of nature is that every man divest himself of the right he has to all things by nature. So yes, I have this natural right that just stems from my natural powers and abilities to do, to do whatever I want, whatever I'm strong enough to lift, whoever I'm strong enough to attack or exert my will over. But if I'm pursuing peace, the first thing I have to do is say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give up that right to do whatever I want. So the fundamental law of nature is to pursue peace, but an immediate implication of that is divest yourself of this natural right that you have. Okay? Towards contributing, as we'll see, to a civil society. Now, you never you 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 can never ultimately give up that natural right. You just divest yourself of it if it's in your, if in, you can pursue peace and reasonably get it then. But if your society collapses and every, if, if all authority collapses here and it's every man for himself in a war of all against all, then your natural rights are still intact. You can still do whatever you have to in order to survive. And where there isn't a civil society, you travel to some other place like Texas or something where they don't, they don't, they just, it's all marauders and pirates wandering around, um, then you have your natural right to protect yourself. If somebody's attacking you when you're walking to your car after class, okay, and so peace has been violated, you still have your natural right to, to defend yourself and attack that person, prevent it from happening. Don't be cruel, because we all agree that's wrong, but you still maintain that natural right. But in pursuit of this law to always promote peace, we need to divest ourselves of this right to do whatever is in our power to do. Okay, And that is reiterated. I've given you the parallel passages in on the citizen and Leviathan. Um, he makes distinctions and gives definitions distinguishing between a gift, a contract, and a, and a covenant. And the reason this is important is because the third law of nature is that you should perform all covenants that you've made. So what is a covenant? It's not a free gift, like when I just give you two tokens to use in this class, and I just, out of, out of my own generosity, give you that currency, not expecting any reciprocal benefit. And it's not a contract when, a contract is when I'm doing this for mutual benefit. We're both, we were both thinking we get some benefit out of the agreement. But it's a special kind of contract. In all contracts where there's trust, the promise of him that's trusted is called a covenant. And this, though it be a promise and of the time to come, yet does it transfer the right when that time comes, no less than an actual donation. So a covenant is an agreement based on trust, not based on the immediate reciprocal benefit. Okay. And the third law of nature in human nature is that uh, one should always perform and abide by these covenants or agreements that are made on trust. So he says, the law of nature that every man should divest himself of the right to do whatever he wants in accordance with his natural right would be utterly vain, empty, that means, and of no effect if this were also not a law of nature, that every man is obliged to stand for and perform those covenants which he makes. For what benefit is it to a man that anything be promised or given unto him if he 
that gives or promises doesn't perform that and retain still the right of taking back whatever he's given. Okay, so performing covenants, abiding by contracts and keeping trust is a law of nature. Okay, one that we routinely violate, but it's a law of nature that we ought to keep those contracts. If you're ever wondering why you should keep contracts, there's a lot of prudential reasons to do it. But there's also a moral reason to do it. You're, you're going to war if you don't abide by your contracts. Right? Another law of nature that derives, mutual aid. It's also a law of nature that every man do help and endeavor to accommodate each other, as far as may be without danger to their persons and loss of their means to maintain and defend themselves. Okay? Otherwise, if you aren't helping, as he says, foreseeing the causes of war and desolation proceed from those passions by which we strive to accommodate ourselves and to leave others as far as we can behind us, it follows that passion, that, that passion by which we strive mutually to accommodate each other must be the cause of peace. So if the reason we go to war is because we have differing passions, okay, or we have the same passion for some thing that is limited and can't be divided, then if that's the cause of war and there's a natural law, the fundamental natural law, which says to pursue peace, then it must follow that we should be helping each other and not hurting each other. Yeah? So it is ideal sort of society that not to be many hierarchies because if the goal is to you know, just have the minimum to defend yourself and then and your natural rights and then any surplus is to you to be used to help one another, then it would not allow people to accumulate, you know, really beyond what Well that I, he hasn't said anything about a perfect society or really anything about a society at all yet. Okay, so let's leave that for later. We're still rising ourselves up out of the state of nature. And there are a lot of different ways that societies can be organized, monarchies, democracies, oligarchies, and so forth. And that, the point, all of that analysis of those societies and which one's better than the other, I don't know if he believes in an ideal society. In fact, I'm pretty sure he doesn't because I think that Phoenix was just talking to me about a research project he wants to do in this class about Hobbes' criticism of ideal societies like Plato's. So, so I don't, the, the question seems to be based on an idea that he has an idea about ideal society. I think he rejects that. I meant it as sort of like a real world impact. There wouldn't be many hierarchies if we follow that like uh, statement. I don't. I don't see how that follows at all. In fact, his view is that there must be hierarchies. We must submit to some authority that's going to enforce these uh, peace. And if we don't have such an authority, we won't have peace. We'll be in a state of war of all against all. So I. I think the assumption behind the question is flawed and the direction you're expecting the answer to go, that he's eliminating hierarchies, is exactly backwards. He's building hierarchies. He's, he's explaining a natural basis for building an artificial hierarchy of, of humans. Okay, but, but still, it's still in, in pursuit of building that hierarchy, it's still true that we should all become useful to each other. Another law of nature that follows from that is that we all treat each other as equal. To make a long story short, it's the not treating other people as equal that is a cause of war. Another law of nature is that <coughs> we should distribute things equally. And things, things that can be divided, we should distribute equally or give everybody equal access to them. Um, if they can't be divided, like a piece of land that we can't divide for everyone, then we should allow common use. And if not everybody can use it at the same time, we should have some method of rotating who gets to use it, or a lottery system that decides who gets to use it. But in order to make it as equally as possible, and that follows from what he said about equalities. Now another, an absolutely key law of nature that we will conclude today on is arbitration. So 
if there's controversies about how things are distributed and who gets to access the park at a certain time or whatever, we ought to mutually agree upon some arbiter who we both trust and we mutually contract or covenant to, um, to agree to implement whatever they say. Okay, so we submit to the judgment of an arbiter. Now, that is but one step away from the final step he needs to complete the idea that we should all submit to some authority who is capable of maintaining peace among ourselves and peace with respect to external invaders of our community. Okay, so that's what we will discuss next time in addition to the beginnings of civil society and the, and the artificial body politic, and we'll have concluded his account of human nature and the human politics.